You're listening to The Jacob Balk Show. He's breaking down the latest and greatest in sports as only he can. Follow him on Twitter at Real Jacob Balk. Here he is, Jacob Balk. edition of the Jacob Volk Show. I am the Jacob Volk, except no imitation. I've got to start with Patriots Falcons. You remember when I was praising Arthur Smith? Remember when I said he was doing a solid job for the Falcons? Remember when I said they were 4-5, and five, only a half game behind the Panthers for the final wild card spot in the NFC? Yeah. Tough to defend that right now. It's one thing to struggle on offense. Every team is going to have games like that. It's another thing to get shut out. It's hard to get shut out in the NFL. You basically need to do everything wrong. Your opponent needs to do everything right. You don't see a lot of shutouts in the NFL. So for the Falcons to get shut out on Thursday night football, with the entire sports world watching, because there was nothing else on last night, that's a new level of ineptitude. And I'll say this, it takes skill to only score three points in your last two games. The Falcons right now are free-falling They played like garbage. They couldn't get anything going offensively to save their lives. It took Matt Ryan until the third quarter to get to 100 passing yards. I understand that the Falcons were without Cordero Patterson and they were without Calvin Ridley, but that is no excuse. For you, the quarterback, to not have a hundred passing yards by halftime. I mean, here was the worst part. The game was actually close. Until the end of the fourth quarter, you really couldn't turn it off. It was 16-0 Patriots with six and a half minutes left in the game. Granted... That's not an easy comeback to pull off, but it's not impossible. Touchdown, two-point conversion, quick stop, touchdown, two-point conversion. Not impossible. Not easy, maybe not even likely, but not impossible. Instead, on the Falcons' last three drives, they threw interceptions. The Falcons accomplished something that I didn't even know had happened previously in NFL history. They had three different players throw an interception in the same game. The last time that happened was December 6, 2009. The Houston Texans 
had three different players throw interceptions. Matt Shaw, Rex Grossman, and Chris Brown. You may be thinking to yourself, Jacob, Chris Brown was a running back. If you thought that he was a singer, you're probably listening to the wrong show because I don't talk about him. I like Rihanna. I'd say to you, very good memory. Chris Brown was a running back. Had a couple good years for the Titans, as a matter of fact. So your follow-up question may be, when is the last time that three different quarterbacks threw an interception in the same game? Good question. The last time that happened was November 12th, 2000. Ryan Leaf Jim Harbaugh and Moses Moreno of the San Diego Chargers threw interceptions in the same game. The thing is, though, in neither one of those cases did those other teams throw three straight picks from three different quarterbacks on three straight drives, especially in the fourth quarter. That may be a new level of ineptitude. I mean, you've got to feel bad for the Falcons' defense. They were keeping the Falcons in it. I wasn't overly impressed with what I saw from the Patriots. Here's what I saw. I saw smart football. Mac Jones made one mistake. Okay. A.J. Terrell's a really good player. I'm not going to kill Jones for that. Do I like Mac Jones? Absolutely not. I think he's being overrated. I understand that he's the best quarterback out of all the rookies. I understand that he has more wins this year than all of the other rookies combined. I totally get that. But Jones isn't flashy. He's not exciting. Again, he makes smart decisions with the football. He only had four incompletions, one of which was the interception. He completed 22 of 26 passes for 207 yards, and he threw a touchdown pass to Nelson Aguilar in the second quarter. But you watch him play. Don't you see a game manager? You don't see a guy who's going to win games by himself. Look, I said this about Mac Jones as he was leaving Alabama. He was going to have a long career in the NFL as a Ryan Fitzpatrick type, as a game manager. As a low-end starter slash high-end backup. You want to tell me he's not a low-end starter? He's a little higher than that? Okay. I'll give you medium-end starter. And I'm not saying that the Patriots should move on from him. That's ridiculous. I'm not saying he's a bust. What I'm saying is you can do better than him. He's not exciting. He doesn't win games by himself. And at the end of the day, that's what the best quarterbacks in the league do. But it's hard for me to be impressed with you when through three quarters, you only put up 13 points against a Falcons defense that really isn't as good as you made it look. I thought Anthony Rush was really good. Obviously, Terrell was the best player on the Falcons. Adeto Kunbo Ogundeji was good. Foyasade Oloakun was good. Deron Harmon was really good. You just made the Falcons' defense look a lot better than they really are. 
I mean, the real story here is the ineptitude of the Falcons' offense. I don't want to take anything away from what the Patriots did defensively. Every single Patriot on defense played well. All right, no question about that. But even then, you'd expect an offense to put up some points. Put up a field goal, right? Don't get shut out. I can honestly say, and admittedly, there are people who have seen a lot more of Matt Ryan than me, but I can honestly say that I have never seen Matt Ryan play worse than he's played the last couple weeks. Against the Cowboys, he was absolutely dreadful. Against the Patriots, he was inept. In his last two games, he has completed just 28 of 50 passes for 270 yards, no touchdowns, and four interceptions. To put that into perspective, Mike White on Sunday completed 24 of 44 passes for 251 yards and four interceptions. Similar, right? I mean, give White credit. He accomplished in one game what it took Ryan two games to do. There's something there, right? I understand that Ryan was short-handed. No Patterson, no Ridley. I totally get that. And the offensive line couldn't stop a Pop Warner team. But I expect Matt Ryan to be better than this. I mean, Matt Ryan is going to get Hall of Fame consideration. Matt Ryan last year was really, really good. This guy is thrown for over 4,000 yards in every season from 2011 to 2020. For him to have these types of games is stunning. I mean, I'm not going to kill him too much for getting destroyed by the Cowboys. It was a terrible performance. There's no question about that. But any team, any quarterback, any player can be off on any given night. I mean, that happens. But fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. These are now two dreadful games in a row. The Falcons are now 4-6. and six. They had the opportunity to be tied with the Panthers for the final wildcard spot. And if the Saints lose on Sunday, and the Panthers lose on Sunday, you're only a half game behind the Saints for the second wildcard spot. This was a big game for the Falcons. This was a winnable game. A revenge game. 28-3. I know Falcons fans are sick of hearing about it, but until you win a Super Bowl, people are going to keep bringing it up. And even then, it's going to live on in the annals of NFL history. Instead of enacting a little bit of revenge... You lay an egg. That's not going to work for me. That performance by the Falcons yesterday was absolutely inexcusable. I mean, for goodness sake. You have third and one at the Patriots' 14-yard line. 
You score a touchdown on that drive, you're down 10 to 7. What's the one thing you can't do in that spot? Take a sack. Live to fight another day. Live for fourth down. Find a way to get a yard. Instead, Ryan takes a sack. It becomes fourth and 14. No way the Falcons are going for it, so they kick the field goal. Then a flag comes in. Illegal formation. I'm sorry, but doesn't the field goal unit practice lining up for field goals, snapping field goals, holding field goals, blocking field goals, and kicking field goals every week? Isn't that like the one thing they do? That's an inexcusable penalty. So instead of Young Wei Ku kicking a 45 yard field goal, he has to try a 50 yard field goal and he misses it wide left. Right there, you had a sinking feeling in your stomach that the Falcons weren't going to get much going. The defense kept them in it, but the Falcons couldn't convert. Then the score becomes 19-0, under two minutes left. Arthur Smith pulls Ryan and puts in Josh Rosen. Now, you may remember this, but I loved Josh Rosen coming out of UCLA. I thought he was the best quarterback in that draft. I thought he was going to be a great player for years to come. Oh my God. Was I wrong? Hey, Mel Kuyper has Jimmy Clausen. Todd McShay has Brian Brom. I have Josh Rosen. His third pass of the game. He throws a pick six to Kyle Van Noy. Rosen has come in in mop-up duty in back-to-back weeks. In both of those outings, he has thrown an interception. Not for nothing, but to have two interceptions in two games when you're only playing a little bit in the fourth quarter, that takes skill. Like, that's impressive. Two picks on nine passes? Job well done. Then Felipe Franks comes in, he attempts his first ever pass in the NFL, and it gets picked off. Back-to-back plays. Falcons backups got picked off. This pick was by Adrian Phillips. I have expected the Patriots to try to Get another score, but they didn't. It doesn't get any worse than this, Falcons fans. I feel for you. I really do. I'm telling you, ever since 28-3, that franchise has gone downhill. It's incredible how an epic choke job like that The worst choke job in NFL history. One of the worst choke jobs in sports history can set a team back for this long. At the end of the day, it's just one game. I understand that it's the Super Bowl. And yeah, you have the whole offseason to be upset about it. But then week one hits... And you forget about it, right? No. That choke has hung over the Falcons franchise like a storm cloud ever since it happened. The best thing for the Falcons to do may be to trade Matt Ryan. See, here's the thing. 
and I said this at the time, the Falcons taking Kyle Pitts and trading Julio Jones made no sense. Drafting Pitts as opposed to Justin Fields signals that you're trying to win this year. Trading Jones signals that you're trying to rebuild. If the Falcons had taken Fields at four and had traded Julio Jones, they'd be in a much better spot for the future than they are right now. Now the Falcons are in purgatory. They're four and six. They're going to have a lot of quarterback needy teams Ahead of them in the draft, the Lions, the Texans, the Dolphins, the Seahawks, maybe, depending on what happens with Russell Wilson, the Giants, and Washington. All those teams could conceivably take quarterbacks. You had Justin Fields fall into your lap at four. I understand that Fields has struggled early on in his career. But a lot of rookies do that. You can't tell me that Fields doesn't have sky-high potential. Also, he's playing behind an offensive line that's like Swiss cheese. Fields has been sacked 29 times. Tied for the most in the NFL with Ryan Tannehill. And think about this. Tannehill has started every game for the Titans. Fields hasn't started every game for the Bears. He didn't start the first two games. The Falcons would be in a much better spot for the future if they had just taken Fields. You could have traded Ryan, gotten a bunch of picks. Now, who's going to take him? It's looking really bleak for the Falcons right now. It's going to take a while before they can right the ship. There's no way to sugarcoat it, Falcons fans. This is tough. Moving on now to the Eagles, signing Dallas Goddard to a four-year extension worth $59 million, 35.7 of which is guaranteed. 59 mil over four years is just under 15 mil per year. This makes him the second highest paid tight end in the NFL behind only George Kittle. Dallas Goddard is really good. I wouldn't use the word great to describe him. I understand that his whole career he was playing behind Zach Ertz. Then Ertz gets traded. And it's the Goddard show. The thing is, while Goddard's Good, and he's certainly one of the 10 best tight ends in the NFL. He's not the second best. This guy has 29 catches for 429 yards and two touchdowns. His best year was 2019 when he had 58 catches for 607 yards and five touchdowns. You can't give him more than Kelsey. You can't give him more than Mark Andrews. You want to give him more than Hunter Henry and Jonu Smith? Yeah, that's fair. I have no problem with that. Like, if you wanted to give Goddard a four-year deal worth 55 mil just under 14 mil per year, I would have had no problem with that. I would have been praising this contract. But this was a massive overpay. I understand that Goddard was a pending free agent. 
And he would have made a ton of sense for the Jets. I understand that you were probably always going to have to overpay Goddard. So do you overpay him now or do you overpay him in March? If you wait until March, you may not have the opportunity to overpay for him. He may get a godfather offer from a team like the Jets and he just bolts. The thing is, though, it's just tough for me to endorse this contract. Even if the Jets would have given it to him, I would have had a tough time rationalizing it. You want to tell me that the Eagles needed to keep Goddard around? You're right. I understand why the Eagles did this. I just would have drawn more of a line in the sand. Was there really a rush to get this done? You could have waited until, like, February. I know why the Eagles did it. I don't hate the logic. This is just a big overpay. And I can't sanction it. I'm not in love with this move. All right, now it's time for me to make my three NFL picks. Went one and two last week, 14 and 16 overall. If I go three and oh, I'm over 500. That's how I'm looking at this. I like the Packers minus one and a half over the Vikings. I understand that the Packers are without Aaron Jones. But A.J. Dillon is incredibly talented. There have been games where he's been like right up there with Jones in terms of production. And now that Rodgers has a game under his belt after returning from the coronavirus, I think he'll play a lot better. I think the Packers will be motivated. They're going up against a division rival. At the end of the day, the Packers are better than the Vikings. They just have more talent. Minus one and a half is almost a pick em. I think the Packers are going to win this game. Give me the Packers minus one and a half. As for my upset, I don't think that the Giants will beat the Buccaneers on Monday. All right, I don't see that happening. But I think they can cover an 11-point spread. Last year when these two teams met, the Giants came really close to winning. Now, granted, this is a much worse Giants team than last year's Giants. And that's saying something, because last year's Giants weren't as good as Giants fans want you to believe. But, they are getting Saquon Barkley back. They're coming off their bye. Chris Godwin's banged up. I think the Giants can cover... An 11-point spread. And my final pick is the Ravens minus 4.5 over the Bears. I understand that the Bears are home. But the Ravens got embarrassed on Thursday night football a week ago yesterday by the Dolphins. I think they're going to be ticked off. They had 10 days to stew over it. I think they're going to look to go into Chicago and put their foot on the throat of the Bears. I think that Lamar Jackson can go off against a Bears defense that is not good against the run, that does give up a lot of points. 
I do think the Ravens will win by a touchdown. So my picks are Packers minus one and a half, Giants plus 11, and Ravens minus four and a half. All right, now I'll give you some college football vault talk. There are three games that'll take place tomorrow featuring two ranked teams. The first one of which is the game of the week. Michigan State versus Ohio State. I said this on Wednesday. If the Spartans win, they will get into the top four according to the CFP committee. There's no way that they'd leave MSU out after they beat OSU. I think they would have the Spartans leapfrog the Bearcats. And the Wolverines. I mean, people are overlooking the Spartans. The Buckeyes are favored by 19. I understand that this game is in the horseshoe. And it's very tough to go into Columbus and win. But put some respect on the Spartans' name. They're a good team. They're a really good team, as a matter of fact. Peyton Thorne's a better quarterback than people give him credit for. He's completed just under 63.5% of his passes for 2,460 yards, 21 touchdowns, and 8 interceptions. But obviously, the Spartans' offense revolves around Kenneth Walker III, one of the best running backs in the nation. You gotta wonder how Wake Forest let him go. I understand that Wake Forest is really, really good this year, but they'd be a lot better with Walker. They may have beaten UNC with Walker. This guy's averaging six and a half yards per carry. He already has just under 1,500 rushing yards. He has 17 touchdowns. He's incredible. Jaden Reed is really good. He has 45 catches for 829 yards and 7 touchdowns. Jalen Naylor's having a good season. 31 catches for 587 yards and 6 touchdowns. Trey Mosley's putting it all together. 28 catches for 417 yards and 2 touchdowns. The Spartans have a really good wide receiver trio. Naylor is a little banged up, though. I will say that. He's missed the last couple games with a hand injury. He's questionable for tomorrow. But I know he's gonna try to convince Mel Tucker that he's okay to go. Defensively, you've got to look out for Jacob Slade, Jacob Panasiuk, Xavier Henderson, Jeff Petrowski, and the corners, Darius Snow, Ronald Williams, and Chester Kimbrough. Like I said, the Spartans are better than people give them credit for. As for the Buckeyes, we all know how great they are. C.J. Stroud is having an excellent season. He's completed just under 69% of his passes for over 3,000 yards, 30 touchdowns to 5 interceptions. Travion Henderson is already a 1,000 yard back. He has 14 touchdowns. Jackson Smith and Jigba 
Garrett Wilson and Chris Olave comprise probably the best wide receiver trio in the nation. But I've said this before, what doesn't get talked about enough with the Buckeyes is their defense. They don't really have any great players. Zach Harrison's having a really good season, but I wouldn't call him great. This is a defense where the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Give Kerry Coombs a ton of credit. He's the Buckeyes' defensive coordinator. And could be in line for a head coaching job somewhere, if he wants it. He's never been a head coach before in college. Longtime high school coach in Ohio. But I could see him taking the jump. I mean, this is going to be a really good game. The Spartans are going to cover the 19-point spread. Make no mistake about it. They have a better defense than the Buckeyes do. Maybe the stats don't show it, but they have more exciting players. However, the Buckeyes have the better offense by far. I can't see the Buckeyes losing this game. In the horseshoe, not going to happen. Give me the Buckeyes. Moving on now to Arkansas, Alabama. I've spoken highly about the Razorbacks in the past. I did look at them early in the season as a team that could go on a big run. But then they lost three straight. And that kind of killed their dreams. I mean, Arkansas runs a very exciting option offense. K.J. Jefferson is very good at orchestrating it. And you've got to key in on Traylon Smith, Raheem Sanders, and Dominique Johnson also. It's an exciting offense. It's a classic college option offense. I'll say this, though. One thing that really makes it work is the offensive line. From left to right, you've got Myron Cunningham, who's going to be a great player in the NFL. Brady Latham... Ricky Stromberg, Bo Limmer, and Dalton Wagner. That may be the best offensive line in the nation. Defensively, the Razorbacks have a ton of really talented players. Grant Morgan, Bumper Pool, Monteric Brown... Isaiah Nichols, Torian Carter, Hayden Henry, Joe Fucha, Jashad Stewart, Zach Williams, etc., etc. They just have a ton of impact players that they shuffle in and out, and they make life pretty difficult for their opponents. Like, this isn't the easiest game in the world for... The Crimson Tide. I understand that it's at Brian Denny, but Arkansas is good. The thing is, though, it's impossible to pick against Alabama. They're Alabama. Do I need to tell you how good Alabama is? You know how good Alabama is. Bryce Young is one of the best quarterbacks in the nation. Brian Robinson Jr. is one of the best running backs in the nation. Jamison Williams and John Mechie comprise arguably the best wide receiver duo in the nation. Their defense is chock full of great players. Jordan Battle, Will Anderson Jr., 
Fedarian Mathis, Jalen Armour Davis, Byron Young, Dallas Turner, Brian Branch. I mean, the list runs a mile long. Alabama's going to win this game. I mean, I could see Arkansas covering the spread, plus 20 and a half. But I don't think this game will ever be in doubt. I think Crimson Tide fans can rest easy. Roll Tide. The last game to talk about is Oregon-Utah. A very, very important game. You know that the Pac-12 is going to be rooting hard for Oregon. If Oregon loses this game, or the Civil War, or the Pac-12 title game, they're not getting a CFP representative. And Utah may be the toughest team that Oregon faces until they get to the playoff. I mean, this game is in Salt Lake City. You know that Utes fans are going to be out in force. I'll tell you something. Utah is favored by a field goal. When's the last time that happened? The third-ranked team in the nation is an underdog in a regular season game. Oregon runs a really exciting option offense led by Anthony Brown. It's very similar to Arkansas's offense. Travis Dye is having a really good year. He can eclipse a thousand rushing yards tomorrow. No CJ Verdell, which is tough. Obviously, he's out for the year, but. But, Byron Caldwell has talent. Defensively, the Ducks have Kayvon Thibodeau, one of the best defensive players in the nation. They also have guys like Popo, Omave, Brandon Dorless, Mikhail Wright, DJ James, Noah Sewell, etc., etc. Those guys are all incredibly talented. As for Utah, they're a ground-and-pound team. They actually remind me a lot of the early Rex Ryan Jets. They like to run the ball down your throat and kill you with defense. And it works because they have some really talented running backs... In Tavion Thomas, Micah Bernard, and TJ Pledger. Thomas may be a little banged up, but he should be ready to go. Defensively, the Utes have four of the best defensive players in the nation. Devin Lloyd, Micah Tafua, Vontae Davis, and Nephi Sewell. All those guys are capable of going off on any given night. I mean, they are going to make Oregon's life incredibly difficult. I mean, it's fair to wonder, will this high-powered Ducks offense be able to go off against the great defensive players that Utah has? This is going to be a great game. But all in all, I'm going to go with the upset. I think Oregon has the better team. I think Kayvon Thibodeau will go off. I think he'll limit Utah's ground and pound game. This could be a close game, but it's a game that I think Oregon will win. Give me the Ducks. I'll close this show out with some MLB Volk talk. Specifically on the Rockies signing Elias Diaz to a three-year extension worth 
fourteen and a half million dollars. And this is an outstanding move by the Rockies. Diaz is a really underrated catcher. He is in the top half of catchers in baseball. The thing is, though, the casual baseball fan doesn't know him because he spent his whole career playing for lousy Pirates and Rockies teams. But last year he had 246 with 18 home runs and 44 RBIs. I'll take that from my catcher. I'll take that in a second. And he's a really good fielder, too. Like, with the Pirates, he was not a good fielder. He got to the Rockies, and that changed basically overnight. It was Diaz's 31st birthday on Wednesday. This is a nice birthday gift by Bill Schmidt. Diaz is getting a little over 4.8 mil for the next three years. That's more than fair. This is a great move by the Rockies. It makes a ton of sense. And it's a contract that down the line can be traded very easily if the Rockies decide to go that route. I mean, I'll tell you. I wouldn't have minded Diaz on the Yankees over Sanchez. He would have made a ton of sense. You'll get a New York Jets instant recap right after their game against the Dolphins. Monday night, you'll get a Brooklyn Nets show. Regular episodes of the Jacob Volk show will come your way. Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Obviously, next week is Thanksgiving. So I'm not going to give you a show on Thursday and Friday. Also, from December 12th to December 19th, You're not going to get any shows. I'll be in Florida with my parents. Thank you for your understanding. Until next time, I'm Jacob Volk. And always remember, if you disagree with me, you're wrong.